body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined by my producer, Joel. And today, we are covering one of the most brutal cases out there, and that is the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. If you've never heard of this one before, prepare yourself because it is a very, very dark and twisted one. Before we dive into that case, though, I wanted to let you guys know that the Halloween merch collection is now live at milehiremerch.com. Go and check it out because there is very limited quantities of everything. So if you want something, make sure you get it now because I'm not sure if we'll be able to restock some of these designs. So definitely check it out. We spent a lot of time on it. I'm really happy with how everything came out. Yeah, me too. Yeah, they're, it's really, really sick. What's your favorite design? I would say I do like the the you know the skull candle logo. Yeah, you know, I love that one too. Some about it, but they're all really cool. Can yeah, we... we've got the my favorite is the the ram skull. Yeah, um, I think that one's that really so cool. Sick. And then uh, the witch, of course, is mm. is awesome too. All of them are just really cool. The quality is gonna is outstanding. I didn't cheap out on the quality at all. It's gonna last you a very long time. So it is a definitely a good purchase to make plus it'll be supporting us in the lights out podcast which we really appreciate again you can check that collection out at milehiremerch.com also this does ship worldwide so you should be able to get it wherever you are listening from and as always make sure you check out my cbd brand higher love wellness if you haven't tried cbd before it is a great way to just allow yourself to chill out relax what i love about cbd is that you can use it while you're at work and you can still get your work done. Doesn't get you high. There's there's all of our products have no THC in it. So, you know, you don't have that high factor and it really makes it nice to use while you're at work. I mean, you can take a CBD dab on your lunch break <laughs> yeah. and be completely fine, but also just mellow, you know, mellow out your mood Definitely. and just help you get through the rest of, of that busy work day. Again, you can get 10% off at higherlovewellness.com if you use code lights out. We've got a couple different waxes out there. We've got some tinctures. We've got delicious gummies, which are basically like adult fruit snacks. <laughs> yeah. Really, really good stuff. So if you haven't checked out higherlovewellness.com yet, I would love if you check it out. We work very hard on that. That's literally my second job. I'm a podcaster by day and I'm a CBD dealer by night. <laughs> so check out higherlovewellness.com. Would really appreciate your support on that. Also, this episode is brought to you by Babel, Sundance Now, and Honey. More on them later. But that's all I got for announcements. It's been a crazy month just overall, and we're really excited with how everything's turned out with these episodes for October. We got Halloween coming up in a couple days, so have fun out there. It's going to be a totally different year than last year with the pandemic. Go to a haunted house, go to a yeah. haunted corn maze, get some Halloween spirit. Hopefully the Lights Out podcast has helped put you in that spooky spirit. I mean, we do our best. And again, this is uh, the official podcast of Halloween. Right? Yeah. So just want to say thank you all for the support, kind Thanks, words, guys. the ratings, and reviews, even the, the critical ones. We take it all to heart and we do our best to put out the best quality content for you. And we've got so much more planned for the future. Just wait, hold on, because... Yeah. We've got a whole new studio coming to you. We're oh. just getting started. Oh, man. Know? We got so much more plans. The new studio is going to be sick. It's going to be totally different vibes than this one. It won't be as hard on the eyes. <laughs> I know some of you are like, God damn, that sign. God damn sign. It hurts my eyes, honestly. Yeah. And I'm I'm sitting in front of it. And our new studio is going to be way, way different. Mm. Way different vibes. I think you're going to really like it. So that's coming in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. But let's go ahead and dive right into the Wineville chicken coop murders because there is a lot to cover. But we're going to go ahead and start this story with a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott. So Gordon Stewart Northcott was born on November 9th, 1906 in Bladworth, Canada. His family then moved to British Columbia where Gordon grew up and went to school. And through his childhood, he maintained a close relationship with his parents, Sarah Louise and Cyrus George. At first, Sarah Louise suffered from postpartum depression and actually resented her son after childbirth. But eventually, she grew to love her son more than anything else in the world. Gordon actually became her golden child, and the two of them got along really well. She loved him so much, and she would do anything for him. And he knew this. At school, he was popular. He made plenty of friends and enjoyed a large social circle. 
His good looks and his intelligence drew a lot of people close to him. And by his late teens, he was well liked by everyone in town. While in school, he found a talent playing the piano. He loved classical music, and he even made money playing venues around town. By the end of high school, he had a great group of friends, a budding music career, and his whole life ahead of him. But when he turned 18, his life was suddenly uprooted because his parents decided that they would all move to Los Angeles, California. Nothing like sunny LA. Of course, it was nothing like their home in Canada, as LA was a place of stardom, entertainment, and big money. During the 1920s, the US economy had surged, and more people had time to spend on leisure. So the streets of LA were packed with people going out to eat, or maybe seeing a show, or a movie. Even though it was much different from Canada, Gordon's parents thought LA would be perfect for him. In his teen years, Gordon developed a flamboyant personality and talked with a feminine voice. He wore bright clothing and always maintained his image. This kind of personality was generally scoffed at in the 1920s, but LA was much more accepting of his style. He was a flashy musician, and LA seemed right up his alley, as there were plenty of opportunities available for Gordon. He was now a grown man in the eyes of his parents. He turned 18 years old, and it was time for him to start working towards a career. So when they asked him what he wanted to do, Gordon said he wanted to raise chickens out in the country. Which this was a huge shock to his parents because they had never once seen Gordon get his hands dirty. Gordon was interested in fashion and playing the piano, and he had never done a hard day's work in his life. But Gordon reassured his parents that this is what he wanted to do more than anything else. And of course, his mother wanted to give her son anything he wanted. Eventually, his parents caved and bought a property out in Wineville, California. It was in the middle of the desert and very isolated. The closest neighbors were several acres away. It didn't seem like the kind of place Gordon would thrive, but he was determined to make it work. The property they purchased was an empty lot at first, but with a bit of startup money from his parents, he and his father began building a small ranch house and chicken coops. He promised his parents he would become self-sufficient and make a living for himself, and since Gordon was their golden child, they believed every word he said. As Gordon and his father began building the ranch, they realized that it was tough doing it by themselves. So Gordon's 13-year-old nephew, Sanford Clark was sent by his mother to help his uncle Gordon. He left his home in Canada and came all the way out to Wineville in 1926. The work prospects at home had run dry and Sanford didn't get along with his mother. So she sent him to live with Gordon Northcott. She thought it'd be a good experience for her son and she hoped he would get some discipline while working out there in the chicken coops. She agreed that Sanford would help build the ranch and then he would return home. But after the ranch was complete, Gordon convinced Sanford's mother that he should come back. As Gordon's father had gone to live in LA, and Gordon didn't want to run the ranch all by himself. Sanford's mother agreed, despite Sanford not wanting to go back to the ranch. He begged his mother not to send him back. Even his sister Jessie protested the move, but it wasn't enough. Sanford's mother sent him right back to Wineville. And before living with his uncle, Sanford hadn't gone through the immigration process, as he was actually living in the U.S. illegally. He didn't know how long his mother would make him stay there, but he hoped he would return home sooner rather than later. On the ranch, Sanford helped Gordon with various tasks, like feeding the chickens, sweeping floors, and cooking dinner. And soon the days out there became weeks, and the weeks became months. On one night, Gordon Northcott woke Sanford up in the middle of the night and he led him out to one of the chicken coops and started beating him endlessly. Sanford screamed and tried to defend himself, but the more he put up a fight, the more violent Gordon became. After he was done beating Sanford, he locked him inside the coop and left him there till the next day. The abuse started soon after he first moved into the farm and nearly every night, Gordon would beat him. Sometimes Gordon used his fists to beat Sanford, while other times he used objects around the farm, like tools and wooden posts. Eventually, the physical abuse wasn't enough, and Gordon escalated to sexual abuse. 
Night after night, Gordon mercilessly beat and raped Sanford out in the chicken coops. Gordon would sodomize Sanford with physical objects found around the ranch. And as much as Sanford would scream, no one would hear him or be able to save him. He eventually learned that the less that he screamed, the quicker it would be over. And when Gordon finished molesting him, he would lean into Sanford's ear and whisper, Better the devil you know. And this is a saying that implies it's better to deal with an awful person you're familiar with, because it would be much, much worse with someone you didn't know. This is a manipulative strategy that Gordon used over and over again. He drilled this idea into Sanford's head. And over time, Sanford ended up believing him. Even though living with his uncle had been the worst experience of his life, Sanford thought that maybe his uncle was right. Maybe there were worse situations out there. And living on the ranch was his only option. This is how Gordon slowly brainwashed his nephew. He knew he had gained total control over Sanford. So on some nights, Gordon even forced Sanford into beating him. He would tell Sanford to hit him, which would then enrage Gordon even more. He received sexual gratification through his rage. And then he would take it out on his nephew. And if Sanford ever refused, Gordon would threaten him. He said he would contact the police and report Sanford for being an illegal immigrant. Gordon had also convinced him that U.S. authorities would sentence him to death if they found out he was an illegal immigrant. And he held this over Sanford's head the entire time he lived at the farm. Being so young, Sanford didn't know any better, so the abuse continued. On top of the physical and sexual abuse, Gordon forced Sanford to do most of the work around the ranch. He tended to the chickens, cleaned the house, cooked the food, and cleaned up the dishes. He basically became Gordon's personal slave. The only food Sanford ate were the leftover scraps when Gordon was done eating. As a result, Sanford became so malnourished that he began losing his hair. In order to cover his tracks, Gordon forced Sanford to write letters home. Unknown to his family, these letters were dictated by Gordon. He chose every word, and he forced Sanford to write them in his handwriting. He would talk about how much fun he was having in his time at school. Of course, this wasn't true because Sanford wasn't having fun and he definitely wasn't going to school. When Gordon was certain he had total control over the situation, he began toying with Sanford. Normally, Gordon kept a watchful eye on his nephew, and when he abused him in the chicken coop, he normally locked the door from the outside so Sanford couldn't escape. But one night, after he had sexually abused his nephew at the end of a broomstick, Gordon left the door unlocked and returned to the ranch house. Sanford picked himself up from the chicken coop floor, beaten, malnourished, and abused. He hobbled to the door where he found it was left unlocked. He then opened the door and stumbled to the edge of the property where he collapsed into the dirt. His freedom was right there within his grasp, but he couldn't go on. Whether he was too weak physically or mentally, he wasn't sure. He just knew he had to get the hell out of there. He saw the neighbor's house in the distance. The path was open, but he couldn't force himself to go any further. So he slowly crawled back to the ranch house where he slept on the couch. Gordon woke up Sanford in the morning by pouring boiling water all over his body, leaving behind scars that would last him the rest of his life. Because Gordon knew that Sanford tried to escape the night before. As Gordon had intentionally left the chicken coop door open, as a test to see if he would leave or stay. Sanford lived on the ranch for over a year with his uncle, and as he aged into his teenage years, Gordon became less attracted to him. He had turned 14 and Gordon realized Sanford wasn't his type any longer. He needed younger victims to fulfill his sexual fantasies. So one day in January of 1928, Gordon left the ranch, telling Sanford he would be gone for about a week. And knowing that he had completely broken Sanford, Gordon knew he wouldn't try to escape. He said he would visit his parents for a short trip and then would be back to tend the ranch soon. Sanford carried on as usual, sweeping the chicken coop, feeding the chickens, and sleeping on the sofa. And when Gordon got back from his trip, he got out of the car with a giant smile on his face. He was in a very happy mood, which was rare. 
Sanford usually only saw him enraged. So Sanford came out to greet him, wondering why his uncle was so happy. And that's when he pulled a silver bucket from the back of his car and told Sanford to take a peek inside. And when Sanford looked over the rim, he quickly drew back. What he had seen was a mess of flesh and blood. Gordon forced him to look again, pushing the bucket towards him. And when Sanford looked inside, he saw through the bloody mess. And in the bottom of the bucket was the decapitated head of a young boy. Gordon said he had killed the boy in self-defense, which Sanford suspected wasn't true at all, because he could just see the thrill in Gordon's eyes. Gordon then opened up the trunk of the car and showed him the boy's body. It laid there lifeless, blood soaked through the sheets that wrapped around the neck. Gordon shoved the silver bucket containing the severed head into Sanford's arms and told him to burn the head. He explained the authorities couldn't identify a victim without the head, which was only partially true. The next day, Gordon dumped the body over a local bridge, and when local authorities found the decapitated body, they couldn't figure out who the boy was, as the boy had no identifiable scars or birthmarks, and all they could conclude was that the boy was most likely Mexican. And to this day, the victim is still referred to as the headless Mexican, which is absolutely terrible. After Gordon dumped the body and Sanford burned the head, they left Wineville for about a week. They traveled to LA to visit Gordon's parents, as this was a good way for him to build an alibi. While they visited, Sanford sat awkwardly in the living room as Gordon caught up with his parents. Gordon's mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, absolutely loved her son, and Sanford could see that this was the case based on the way she served him food and listened to his every word. Gordon was so confident about his mother's love that he went ahead and told her about killing the boy. He told them it was self-defense, and Sarah Louise even praised her son for being so brave. Her son was the light of her life, and she was easily persuaded by his many lies. Sanford just sat there in the living room, absolutely horrified, as Gordon told the story of how he killed the boy while his mother congratulated him. It was obvious to Sanford that Sarah Louise wouldn't believe him if he told her what was actually going on at the ranch. She just loved her son way too much, and that love clouded her reasoning. After returning to the ranch, after this nightmarish trip to LA, Sanford saw many different boys coming and going from the property. Gordon's enthusiasm for violence escalated, and after murdering that first boy, he felt unstoppable. A month later, a boy from LA disappeared. Which this leads us to the disappearance of Walter Collins. On March 10, 1928, Christine Collins gave her son a quarter to see a movie in LA. He wore a lumber jacket, brown corduroy pants, and a gray hat. It wasn't out of the ordinary for a nine year old son to travel alone, as he went to movies often and she didn't think too much of it. As Walter waved goodbye to his mother in the kitchen, that would be the last time Christine would see her son. And the image of what he was wearing that day stayed with her forever. The lumber jacket, brown corduroy pants, and a gray hat. Walter was soon lost in the big city of Los Angeles. After not seeing or hearing from her son for several days, Christine filed a missing persons report with the LA Police Department. Missing children had become a spectacle in Los Angeles, and soon the story of Walter Collins had hit national news. The LAPD quickly came under fire, and the police knew that they needed to quickly find Walter Collins. Only three months earlier, a 12-year-old girl, Marion Parker, had been kidnapped and brutally murdered in LA, and her story became a local drama surrounding the police department's incompetence. The public's perception of the LAPD had taken a downturn, so the pressure was really on. Police Captain J.J. Jones was desperate to find Walter alive. Reports came in from all over the state claiming they had seen boys that looked like Walter, but nothing worthwhile came from their leads. They received dozens of reports. People had claimed to see Walter all over the country, but most of them were bogus. Five months after Walter went missing, LAPD finally got a promising lead. They heard reports of a lost, malnourished-looking boy the same age and description of Walter. But this boy was nearly 2,000 miles away from L.A. in a small town of Illinois. 
The boy looked like he hadn't eaten in days, and he told police a roundabout tale of how he had been kidnapped. In an attempt to confirm the boy's identity with Christine, the two of them exchanged letters and photos over a few weeks. She even spent her own money, which was the equivalent of $1,000 in today's money, to transport the boy from Illinois to California by train. Christine was so happy to see Walter again, and Captain J.J. Jones closed the case. The newspapers praised the LAPD for successfully finding the lost boy, and J.J. Jones was relieved that his department had a win on their side. After the failed case of Marion Parker, this was a huge win for them, but unfortunately that joy wouldn't last for long. When Captain J.J. Jones thought all was said and done, Christine Collins returned to the police station a few weeks later and claimed that the boy they had found was not her son. But J.J. Jones assured her it was. But she insisted it wasn't. She claimed that the boy looked like her son, but his features were slightly different. The police told her that Walter had aged, and it was natural for a nine-year-old boy's appearance to change over a few months. She said that his behavior had changed too, as Walter had always called her mother. But this boy was a nuisance and called her ma. But again, the police still insisted that this was her son and they wouldn't take no for an answer. After the spotlight of national news, Captain J.J. Jones wasn't about to embarrass the department with another failure. He even claimed that Christine was just trying to make him look bad and look like a fool. He even went as far to accuse Christine of trying to neglect her duty as a mother. The case was closed, and he wouldn't budge. So Christine obtained dental records of Walter and compared them to the boys. And she even rounded up several family members and friends that testified that this boy wasn't Walter. The LAPD fought back and even conducted several tests to prove that this was her son. They dropped the boy off at a random location around town and he managed to find his way back home very easily. They also got the family dog to respond to the boy proving that he was its owner. But Christine wouldn't back down, because she knew that this boy wasn't her son. But police wondered why it had taken Christine so long to come forward and tell them that the boy wasn't her son, as she had lived with this boy for nearly three weeks before coming forward. Some suggest that Christine was in such denial that she accepted anything as truth. She had been under so much grief and frustration that she was willing to accept anyone as her son. She couldn't accept the fact that Walter Collins was still out there somewhere. Again and again she fought back against Captain Jones, until he couldn't take it anymore. He became so stubborn about the case that he locked Christine away in an L.A. psych ward under Code 12, a law that allowed him to send almost anyone there. He would rather throw a woman into a mental institution than accept the fact that the LAPD had made a very terrible mistake. While living in the psych ward, Christine suffered physical and emotional abuse from the orderlies, and she even took medication that she knew she didn't need. Because she wasn't crazy, she was absolutely certain that the boy was not her son. Soon guilt overcame the boy that claimed to be Walter Collins. In a handwritten letter to Captain Jones, the boy revealed that his name was not Walter Collins, that in fact, it was Billy Fields. Billy had run away from his home after his mother had died, and when someone in Illinois told him he looked like the missing boy from L.A., he saw an opportunity and took it. Billy had always wanted to go to L.A. and meet the cowboy actor Tom Mix, so he saw Christine's desperation as a free ticket across the country. Even with his confession, it was later confirmed that he was still lying. His name wasn't even Billy Fields. It was actually Arthur Hutchins. Still, the boy's confession solved one mystery, and the LAPD released Christine from the psych ward. But this meant that Walter Collins was still out there, somewhere. But before we continue with the chicken coop murders, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. When I get time to watch TV, I want to be invested in what I watch. I want shows that grab me and keep me invested in the story and the characters. And that's why I love Sundance now. I get to watch exciting shows with entertaining characters and amazing documentaries that I can't wait to watch. Sundance Now is an ad-free streaming service created by AMC Networks for people who appreciate 
riveting storytelling, and fresh perspectives. If meaningful shows are your escape, then Sundance Now is definitely for you. I actually really like Sundance Now because they have over 37 titles in their true crime collection. If you're looking for some recommendations, if you've never heard of the Johnny Gosh case, that is a mind-blowing one about a missing boy named Johnny Gosh, and there is a great documentary film on that case called Who Took Johnny that I highly recommend, and you can watch that on Sundance Now. There's a great one on Jonestown that I've watched. There's a relatively new one, I believe, on Rosemary and Fred West, who are brutal serial killers out of the UK, but they have tons of both fictional content and nonfiction documentaries that are definitely sure to keep you both entertained and informed. What's great is you can stream Sundance Now on all your favorite devices for as low as $4.99 a month. Just download the app or watch online and discover exclusive shows from around the world instantly. Start streaming your next obsession and try Sundance Now free for 30 days by going to SundanceNow.com and use promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's SundanceNow.com, code LIGHTSOUT for 30 days of free streaming, literally free streaming for 30 days at SundanceNow.com using code LIGHTSOUT. Learning a new language can feel intimidating. When I first decided to give Spanish a shot, I was worried about the level of difficulty, the time commitment, and having to hear how my accent sounded out loud. But thanks to Babbel, the number one selling language learning app, the whole process was addictively fun, fast, and easy. Whether you want to learn a new language for an upcoming trip or as an engaging new hobby, Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons for real-world use. I gotta say, I'm really impressed with Babbel. I prefer it way more than my Spanish class back in high school. Seriously, this is the easiest way to learn, and what I love about it is they give you bite-sized lessons, literally 15-minute lessons. You can do it on your lunch break, you can do it on your way home from work, and you can learn a new language extremely fast with the Babbel app. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans. I mean, who wants to get lesson plans from a robot? But Babbel lessons are created by over 100 language experts, and their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German, but there's many more. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent, which are extremely important with learning a new language. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel, and right now when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. So that is six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com using code LIGHTSOUT because Babbel is language for life. And lastly, today's episode is sponsored by Honey. We all shop online. We all want to save money when we shop online. And sometimes hunting for promo codes can be a pain in the butt. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past because Honey is a free browser extension that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. And Honey now supports over 30,000 stores online, which ranges from all different types, including tech, gaming products, to fashion brands, and even food delivery, which I use Honey for food delivery more often than I should. It's super easy. I was ordering food the other night, got to the checkout, was like, ooh, that's a bit pricey for that food. But then boom, Honey dropped down, and all I had to do is click apply coupons. It searched for a few seconds and then it applied a coupon that saved me, I think it saved me like 20 bucks on my order. And I think my order was like 60 or 70 bucks. So that was a huge bit of savings that I wouldn't have gotten without Honey. Honey has found it's over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. Seriously, if you're not using Honey, I don't know what you're doing. Install it right now. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. If you don't already have Honey, you could straight up be missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in just a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. And to get Honey for free, go to joinhoney.com slash lights out. Again, that's joinhoney.com slash lights out. All right, let's go back to the ranch and see what's going on with Sanford and Gordon. So according to Sanford, Gordon had kidnapped Walter Collins on the night of March 10th as he had seen the boy alone on his way home from the movie theater, and he lured him to his car and brought him back to the ranch. He then locked him in one of the chicken coops out back. As Sanford cooked dinner, he could hear Walter screaming and crying from the chicken coop. 
as Gordon raped him. After Sanford finished cooking, Gordon entered the house covered in sweat and blood. He then sat down at the table, and Sanford served him dinner. Walter's screaming and crying would continue through the night, and a heavy sense of guilt came down on Sanford as he tried to sleep. On the one hand, he was relieved it was no longer him suffering from Gordon's abuse, but on the other, he knew it was at the cost of another boy. Ever since Gordon had moved on to the younger boys, he hadn't laid a hand on Sanford. He even allowed him to sleep on the sofa now instead of being locked in the coop. And as Sanford laid awake at night, he could hear Walter's whimpering, and he wished he could help him, but he knew Gordon had total control. The most Sanford could do was give Walter a word of advice. He told Walter that the less he screamed and the less he fought back, the quicker it would all be over. It didn't seem like much help in the big picture, but Sanford knew that this was the only thing he could do to help the boy. Not long after, Gordon's parents made a surprise visit to the ranch. Sanford stood out in the front yard as the Northcott's car came up the long drive, and when they got out, they greeted Sanford and asked him where Gordon was. This became a crucial moment in Sanford's mind. Since Gordon wasn't around, he had to think quickly. They rarely had visitors at their ranch, especially surprise visitors, and Gordon was nowhere to be seen, and a quick window of opportunity presented itself. Sanford told Gordon's mother that he was over in the chicken coop. This was a lie, but he directed her towards the one where Walter Collins was imprisoned. He doubted that this plan would work at all. It crossed his mind that even though she would find Walter, she wouldn't do anything about it. As he remembered the way she praised Gordon when he told her about killing the Mexican boy. But Sanford figured that this was his only chance. As Sarah Louise opened the door to the coop, she was absolutely horrified at what she saw. Young Walter Collins lay on the floor, bloodied and bruised. His clothes were filled with holes and covered in blood. His eyes were bloodshot and he could barely raise himself from the wooden floor. Gordon's mother couldn't barely believe her eyes. She didn't even ask questions. As she saw the helpless boy lying on the ground, she quickly pieced together what had happened. She stood there in silence and didn't ask any questions. As she saw the helpless boy lying on the ground, she quickly pieced together what had actually been happening at the farm. Gordon's parents had always wondered why he wanted to buy a ranch out in the middle of nowhere, or why he wanted to raise chickens. But as she looked at the battered boy spitting up blood on the chicken coop floor, it all made sense. Gordon wanted the ranch for its isolation, and he wanted the separate chicken coop so he could imprison his victims. Sarah Louise was filled with rage, sadness, and fear, and she stormed towards the ranch house looking for Gordon. Her golden child was actually a monster, and she could hardly believe it. Once she found Gordon, she screamed at the top of her lungs for hours, and Sanford listened through the walls. Gordon cried and wailed as his mother berated him. She couldn't understand how her favorite son had become a violent rapist. Gordon begged his mother to understand, and he promised her it was a one-time thing and that he would never do it again. He even promised he would clean Walter up, return him to his home, and ask his family for forgiveness. But the screaming and crying went on for hours. And eventually things got quiet and Sanford wondered if the Northcott Ranch horrors were finally over. Could Gordon's mother finally put an end to his nightmare? Later in the night, Gordon and Sarah Louise woke up Sanford and told him to come with them. He got up from the sofa and then headed towards the chicken coop. And Sanford noticed that Gordon had picked up an axe along the way. They stopped outside the coop where Walter was held up, and Sarah Louise came over to Sanford. She told him that they were all going to kill Walter together, as they couldn't risk Gordon returning Walter to his home. She realized there was something seriously wrong with her son, but she didn't want to see him go to prison. If Gordon returned Walter, he would easily be caught by the police. Even though she knew her son wasn't the perfect child she had once thought he was, she was still going to try to protect him. Sanford's doubt had come true. Gordon Mother's love for him was too much. So they were all going to kill Walter, and Sarah Louise figured this was the best option. That way, they were all complicit in the murder, and no one would want to rat each other out. Sanford knew he had no say in the matter. He was dealing with a family of psychos, and there was no escape. All three of them headed into the chicken coop, Walter was sprawled out on the chicken coop floor. 
as he had fallen unconscious from dehydration and exhaustion. Gordon approached him first with the axe in his hand, and with no hesitation, he lifted the axe over his head and swung down on Walter. The boy's skull cracked, and blood splattered across the chicken coop walls. Several more times, Gordon swung the axe, with just blood and flesh flying across the coop, and bones cracked beneath each swing. And after he was done, he turned around, covered in blood, and walked over to Sanford and handed him the axe. He approached Walter's body, bloody and gnarled. And with a heavy heart, Sanford swung the axe at the boy. Soon Walter's body barely looked human anymore. It had just become a bloody lump of carnage. And after Sarah Louise took her turn hacking away, Walter's body was unrecognizable. Blood pooled beneath the heap of flesh and bones, and Gordon told Sanford to dig a ditch and bury the body. And so he did. All three of them agreed to never tell anyone about what had happened that night. And once again, Sanford hoped that this was the end. Walter Collins was gone, and Gordon had promised his mother that he would stop kidnapping and killing boys. But of course, Gordon was lying. He had only just begun raping and murdering, and he wasn't going to stop now, as he had become addicted to bloodshed and dominance. Not two months later, after killing Walter Collins, Gordon headed into town and kidnapped the Winslow brothers. Lewis, age 12, and Nelson, age 10, were on their way home from their parents' yacht club. Gordon pulled his car to the side of the road and began talking to them. It's believed he lured the boys by promising they could see his chickens. And they were adventurous boys, and a ranch filled with chickens sounded exciting. Once they were back to the ranch, Gordon fulfilled his promise. He showed them the chickens, but he quickly shoved them into separate chicken coops and locked the doors. As the boys sobbed and screamed from their prisons, Sanford thought this nightmare would never end. He had no idea how many more boys would be raped, tortured, and murdered by his uncle, as it seemed to go on forever. Gordon's parents wouldn't turn him in, and Sanford couldn't escape the ranch. And Gordon just kept on bringing in new victims. But during all the madness, Gordon's anxieties grew. He used to be confident when kidnapping his victims, but the Winslow brothers were different. They were from a rich family. This made Gordon think they might have the resources to find their missing sons. He became paranoid and tried covering his tracks the same way he had with Sanford. He forced the Winslow brothers to write letters back to their parents. The letters told stories of how they ran away to Mexico, and that a nice woman took care of them, and they spent their days building yachts and planes. But still this wasn't enough. Gordon didn't think he was covering his tracks well enough. So one night he woke Sanford up. He led them to the chicken coop where Lewis was locked inside and placed an axe in Sanford's hand. And according to Sanford, Gordon said, You're first this time. Without any question, Sanford knew exactly what his uncle wanted him to do. They unlocked the coop and he walked inside. Lewis was curled up on the floor. And with less hesitation than before, Sanford swung down on Lewis. His ribs cracked and blood spewed from his chest. The chickens stirred as they listened to Lewis scream. Then Gordon took the axe from Sanford so he could finish the job, and they both walked over to the chicken coop where the younger brother, Nelson, was imprisoned and did the same. Except for this time, Gordon took the swing from behind, while Sanford distracted Nelson with conversation. They dragged both bodies out to the yard, where Sanford realized both of the brothers were actually still alive. Although blood was gurgling from their mouths and they moaned in pain, Gordon commanded Sanford to dig two graves, and he obeyed. And as he dug two shallow holes, the boys squirmed and cried as they bled out. And when they threw each boy into their grave, a thud came from the bottom, as the last bit of wind was knocked from their lungs. The words of his uncle rang in his head. Better the devil, you know. But little did Sanford know, his sister Jessie was finally seeing through the fake letters. By this point, Sanford had worked at the ranch for nearly two years. He was fond of his older sister Jessie and he missed her so much while living at the farm. And when Jessie received the letters from her brother, she began to sense that something was terribly wrong. Because the letters sounded tense, forced, and not like her brother at all. The letters told of Sanford going to school, but his writing and spelling weren't improving. When she raised concerns to her mother, she scoffed at her. 
Despite her mother not caring, Jessie knew that she had to do something. But she was only a teenager, so her resources were limited. But she found a way to book a ticket to California. And it took her some time to travel from Canada to Wineville, California. But when she arrived at the ranch, all of her alarm bells went off. Her younger brother had become withdrawn and scared. And the way that their uncle Gordon treated her and her brother raised concerns. A secret horror remained hidden at the ranch. And the only way to understand what was truly going on was to speak with her brother in private, out of earshot from Uncle Gordon. Over a few days, Sanford told Jesse a list of horrific things that were happening on the ranch. Jesse barely comprehended the terrors that her brother was telling her, and she quickly left. But before she left, she told her brother that she would do everything in her power to get him out of there. On her return to Canada, she notified the American consulate of her brother's danger and relayed the horrors that were happening on the ranch. She also mentioned that her brother was an illegal immigrant living in the U.S., hoping that even if they didn't investigate the ranch, they would at least retrieve her brother and send him home. Sanford waited day in and day out for a way to escape the horrors of the ranch. On August 31st, 1928, Uncle Gordon peeked out from the window of his home, where he saw multiple police squad cars pulling up the long dirt road that led to the Northcott Ranch. A long line of dust followed the tire tracks, and Sanford watched as his uncle fell into complete panic. Gordon rushed over to Sanford and grabbed him by the collar. He told Sanford that he needed to stall the police, and if he told them anything about what had happened, he would kill him. Gordon shoved Sanford to the side and scrambled to collect a few things and escape through the back door. He ran straight for the far-off tree line in hopes the police wouldn't see him. And when the police finally approached the ranch, they found Sanford Clark alone, sitting quietly on the sofa. The boy looked incredibly skinny, and he was losing his hair. And for a teenage boy, he looked like he had aged 50 years. At first, Sanford stalled the police and did what he was told. But eventually, when Gordon was long gone, Sanford realized that he was finally out of his uncle's clutches. Sanford made the police promise to protect him, and he would only open up to them once he knew he was safe from his uncle. He wanted to tell them everything, but he barely knew where to begin. The horrors that he endured over the past two years were endless, it seemed. They brought him to a station where they fed him, and then they asked him what had happened at the ranch, and Sanford told them everything with no hesitation. After questioning, the police brought Sanford back to the Northcott Ranch, when Gordon's whereabouts were still unknown. The boy helped identify where the victims were kept and where they were buried, and they dug up several bones, which were later confirmed to be human remains. But no complete bodies were discovered on the property. They also found a bloodied axe and evidence of Boy Scout badges, library books, boy-sized clothing, and letters to parents that seemed to be written by young boys. The police also questioned the neighbors. And as it turned out, through all the years of abuse, the neighbors were aware of it. They later admitted that they could hear the screams at night, but they figured it was none of their business. Abuse in the 1920s was an accepted form of parenting, and for all they knew, Sanford was Gordon's son. They claimed that they weren't aware of any sexual abuse, so they turned a blind eye. Luckily, Sanford's testimony helped piece the case together, and the police began building a strong case against the Northcotts. Gordon was able to flee Wineville with his mother not long after the police arrived to his ranch. The police were able to track down the Northcotts holed up in a small property in Canada, and the police immediately extradited them to the U.S. for questioning. With Sanford's confession, the bloody axe, the human bones, and the clothing found at the Wineville ranch, the Northcotts looked incredibly guilty. Sarah Louise quickly confessed to the killing of Walter Collins in an attempt to protect her son from prosecution. She didn't know that there were several other victims Gordon was suspected of killing. And while Gordon was interrogated separately, he first admitted to killing five boys, but later he insisted he hadn't killed anyone. Sarah Louise also took back her confession, but then later confessed again. It became abundantly clear to investigators that the Northcotts were pathological liars, and they both went to trial separately. Sarah Louise was quickly convicted of killing Walter Collins on December 31st, 1928, and was sentenced to life in prison. She avoided the death sentence because women were immune at the time. Her trial was quick and straightforward, and the public was much more interested in Gordon's trial. He had actually made the front page news across the nation, 
and not many serial killers had come into the spotlight during the 1920s. Gordon had been charged with killing the unidentified Mexican boy and the Winslow brothers, and his trial lasted 27 days. No women were chosen to be on the jury since the court had deemed the case too disturbing for women. And for the duration of the trial, Gordon acted withdrawn and strange. He would make several conflicting statements and quickly gave himself away as a pathological liar. And on February 8, 1929, he was found guilty and was later sentenced to death by hanging. And while he was in prison awaiting execution, he contacted Walter Collins' mother, Christine, by telegram. And they formed a back-and-forth conversation for a while. Gordon eventually told her that if she came to visit him, he would tell her everything he knew about her son. Christine had previously been released from the psych ward after Arthur Hutchins had confessed to not being her son. She had also won a lawsuit against Captain Jones, and he was suspended from duty. He was also ordered to pay Christine $10,800, but he never paid her a dime. And all this time, she still believed her son Walter was out there. And Christine was so desperate to figure out what had happened to her son that she went to visit Gordon on the day of his execution, hoping he would tell her what she wanted to hear. On October 2, 1930, she appeared outside of Gordon's cell waiting for an answer. She greeted him, but he turned his back to her, and he told her that he didn't want to see her, and he didn't know anything about her son, and that he was innocent. And even in his final moments of life, Gordon Northcott never came clean. As they walked Gordon to the gallows, he became weak and cowardly. He asked the guards if it would hurt when they pulled the lever, and he also asked if they would put a blindfold on him so he didn't have to look at the noose. He begged the guards not to make him walk any faster, and he struggled to make his way towards the gallows. When he entered the execution chamber, he cried out to the audience and asked someone to say a prayer for him. And the executioner put the noose around his neck, and within moments they pulled the lever. His neck snapped with a loud crack on the way down. And when they did the last sweep of his cell, they found several notes. Some claimed that his father had killed Walter. Some said he had never met the boy, but in the end Gordon was a liar and he would say anything if it meant his freedom. His mother was paroled after 12 years despite her life sentence and she died in 1944. And Sanford Clark was never tried for murder since they believed he had acted under the threat of death and he was sent to a state school for delinquent youth. He was released early after about two years for his exceptional behavior and he later served in World War II. And despite the atrocities that Sanford had witnessed and been a part of, he went on to live an exemplary life and passed away in 1991. The town of Wineville had been so ashamed by the horrors on the Northcott Ranch that they changed the town's name to Miraloma. The case was highly publicized and the murders were constantly referred to as the Wineville Chicken Coop murders. It is still unknown how many boys were killed on the ranch. Gordon had confessed he abused and murdered anywhere between 5 to 20 victims, but he couldn't be trusted knowing his lack of honesty, and not enough evidence could prove there were more victims. Five years after his execution in 1935, a boy and his parents came forward and told authorities that the boy had been held prisoner at the Wineville Ranch. This was never confirmed, but this boy's story had found its way to Christine Collins, and it gave her a second wind in the search for her son. She never stopped believing he was alive despite everything she had heard and seen. And she still saw Walter in her mind's eye as a little nine-year-old boy, dressed in his lumber jacket, brown corduroy pants, and gray hat as he left the house that day to go see a movie in town. Wow. If there was a crazy case out there, a brutal one at that, this is it. Yeah. Truly a sad one, too. I mean, these poor boys that were brutally tortured and murdered by this absolute psychopath and his family, the Northcots. God, it's really just hard to wrap your mind around how many failings there were by police and just all the things they went through is just really hard to even think about, honestly. Yeah. And I'm still in shock how Gordon's mom, Sarah, didn't do anything. No. To stop what was going on. Which just tells me that like they're just a family of psychopaths. Like they're all the fact that she just joined in with him. Yeah. 
and did whatever he wanted is just crazy. I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe she killed more people too. I mean, if she just joined into this brutal killing, killing people with an axe, like it's really, really disturbing, man. Yeah. Really disturbing. I mean, what a sad story. And I mean, for all we know, there could be other victims out there of Gordon's. And you, and the fact that he never even gave poor Christine Collins closure about what had really happened to her son and that she went basically to her grave thinking that he might be alive out there. Yeah. And that, just that's so fucked up. Oh, it's the most fucked up thing you could possibly do to somebody is is give them false hope right. that your son might still be alive. And she came all this way to see him. Just for him to turn his back on. And he's an utter coward at his death, complaining about being hanged. Like, mm-hmm. really? Disgusting, man. What a disgusting individual. And let's talk about Sanford for a second. I mean, he was apparently Gordon's first victim, but it seems like over that period of time, he became so brainwashed, you know, by Gordon to where, and malnourished. Like, yeah, I mean, skinny. imagine being in his position. He like, couldn't fight back. Yes. Yeah, when you get to that point, I mean, what are you supposed to do? And you know you're going to be killed if you try to escape or yeah. run away or fight him. Like, you know that Gordon's just going to kill you. Right. So it just becomes like, just becomes survival. Like, what do you have to do to survive? And it's, I mean, the trauma that Sanford carried around for the rest of his life mm. on top of going into war. Right. Fought in World War II. Like, whoa. Wow. I mean, I got to say, like, kudos to Sanford for continuing his life and living to the end of it and seems like he lived it in an exemplary way so Mm -hmm. after all of that i mean couldn't even imagine what kind of flashbacks and nightmares he must have had throughout his life from his time on gordon's ranch i mean it's just absolutely insane it is and all of it happened during a time of course when usually in today's times oh you could just call 911 get help right right away but in this time like much easier to isolate Uh uh-huh like you could like serial killers like this would have a much tougher time existing in today's world although they could still i mean if you're isolated enough you could absolutely do stuff i mean there were tons of serial killers that came after gordon clearly but i'm talking about like 2021 Mm -hmm. it would be tougher to keep something like this going yeah what blows my mind is the neighbor's heard right literally heard screaming and didn't do anything because they're like it's not my business right what like i hope those neighbors felt so bad when gordon got arrested and all of his crimes came out and they really they they realized that they could have done something about it like they could have called the police they could have done anything to stop Mm -hmm. And shut down the horrors at this ranch. But one of far their, sooner, right? And one of their excuses was, "Well, child abuse or punishment was normal during this time." Like, what the fuck? Really? That's that's people screaming. That's not and, normal. Come on. Yeah, I don't even really believe that. I mean, I yeah. get it was a different time and hitting your kids or you know beating on them was more acceptable. Yeah. But what the fuck? If you're hearing that. But day people in, being axed to like, death? Come on. No, come on. There's no way you don't hear it here. There's a difference between somebody being beaten and being yeah, killed. Right. Brutally murdered with an axe. I mean, that's gonna be that's gonna just if you hear somebody having that being done to them, mm-hmm. that's gotta make you think, holy shit, something's going on. Somebody's being killed over here. I mean, yeah. it just seems to me like he was happened to be in the perfect spot where he, all of his neighbors were just those people that don't want to bother anybody as long as nobody bothers them and mm-hmm. they just they just let it happen which is just extremely sad and crazy to think that this could have been stopped far sooner than it did and he gordon was able to go on as long as he as he did and potentially kill up to 20 people this way is insane i mean to torture them lock them in a chicken coop oh what a, what a horrible way to to die yeah honestly like i just can't even imagine and can't even imagine what these poor families went through and they found out that that's how their child died like that just be that's so horrific most yeah just upsetting news terrible yeah terrible it's just really hard to even imagine what that would have been like but but a story like this does make me think there's probably all sorts of 
like torture and stuff going on today in these really remote spots, like these isolated areas and everything. Yeah, I'm, sh- I'm sure it still happens, sadly. I mean, we know that, I mean, people get kidnapped. There's mm-hmm. human trafficking. There's all sorts of crazy shit that happens. And a lot of it happens out in these rural areas. I mean, right. there was, I believe it was Johnny Gosh was actually kept at a house here in Colorado at one point, um, which we still believe Johnny Gosh is still out there, but he was kidnapped as a young boy, as a paper boy, and taken, oh which is a God. really crazy case if you've never heard that one before. And again, Sundance now has the Who Took Johnny film. Really recommend watching it, but it'll really put into perspective like what these psychopaths do. They take you and they take you out in the middle of nowhere where there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to go for help. Right. Then the closest neighbor is probably at least, you know, half a mile away. Mm-hmm. So for all they know, the screaming could be some animal being killed. I mean, there's it's just so much easier to get away mm-hmm. with this kind of stuff when you're out in the middle of nowhere. But Still, I mean, if it's a lesson too, like if you hear something that doesn't sound right, say something. Yeah. Like, don't be afraid to call the police if you think something bad is happening to somebody because you might save somebody's life. Like, right. I think that's like the only real lesson you can take away from this is like if you hear somebody something that sound sounds disturbing and like somebody's being hurt, then you should do something about it. Either take it upon yourself to go over there and figure out what's going on, or call the police yeah. you know at least report it and let the police go investigate it and let them figure out if it's you know an animal versus a human but yeah this is a crazy one a really brutal disturbing case and uh yeah that's where i'm gonna leave it this is one of those cases that just kind of leaves you speechless at the end and i don't really even know how to end this episode but that is where we will wrap things up for lights out this week make sure you check out our new collection at mileheimers.com And we will see you guys in another episode on the Lights Out Podcast. Until next time, Lights Out, everybody.